If you have a rusted down, beat up, fallen apart, duct taped together jalopy with half flat tire and you go over a catastrophic bump, it falls apart. You're done. It's toast, right? Your body's the same. If you're, you're super overweight and you're not taking care of yourself and your poop smells like toxic nuclear waste and you're uncomfortable and you can't sleep and you have no energy and, and, and you have a health crisis, you're in trouble. It's a multifaceted approach. Diet. It's exercise, it's your ohana, your support team, it's all the things that we should be doing, setting goals. These are the things that matter for our physical and our mental health. Welcome back to What Matters Most. I'm Jen. And I'm Drew. And we're here with Scott McDermott, and this is part two. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. We talked about some pretty good things before we touched on um, limits and overcoming limits. Let's talk a little bit more about nutrition and how mental health really helps with that, because you're a personal trainer and you probably deal with that a lot. Yeah, that's probably one of the biggest pieces of the journey, recovering from the crash specifically, but nutrition is powerful in so many different ways. I, like, <laughs> I know it sounds old and tired, but nutrition and exercise, oh my gosh, really? Yes. Um, <laughs> like if, if you look at nutrition, if you're putting in good, real foods, single ingredient foods, carrots, chicken, rice, <laughs> this only has one ingredient, right? Yep. The more you have good, real food, single ingredients, the better your body can utilize it. And then everything's better. Like you're healthier. Okay, that's obvious. But what does that mean? Well, you're not dealing with inflammation and physical body stress and hormones get to balance and like your enzymes work and you've got enough gut flora and bacteria to digest your food, which gives you the vitamins and minerals to have energy and better sleep. And they're all related. And people, I think, don't realize what a powerful effect food has. If you're eating fast food and junk food and you're eating trans fats and seed oils like canola oil and they're toxically bad for us. Mm -hmm. And People, it's like, well, I'm busy. And then they just, they go grab their $7 coffee and a muffin. And the muffin's made with the worst kind of oils and fats, loaded with sugar. And, and they're just plowing through their day. They're forcing it. They're using caffeine to bully through their day. Mm -hmm. And there's a better way. I'm caffeine. I don't drink coffee. I don't have any coffee. This is my energy with no coffee. And like... Good, 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 good nutrition makes a huge difference. And people argue whether you should be uh, high protein or high carb or high fat or vegan or vegetarian. I, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. It really doesn't. I can show you an indigenous population in every single example that is super, super, super healthy. I can show you a vegan super healthy population, a vegetarian super healthy population, a meat eating population, a high protein, a high fat, a high carb. They're all brilliantly healthy. They're not eating fast food. They're not eating manufactured seed oils. They're not eating artificial sugars. They're not living on sugar. They're not caffeinating the crap out of their day. So those are some common things we can really trust. And one of the things I love to, to say to people is this um, because people don't get it. They go, yeah, but peach tastes so good. Okay, that's true, but it's not helping you. It's not helping with your goals, right? I mean, I, you, I would live on ice cream and cupcakes, honestly. <laughs> ice cream, cupcakes, and ice caps, I could, but I, I don't. I almost never have that stuff because I know what it does to me and it's not good for me. So, but this is the one thing I love to say. So, okay. I'm going to give you for a month, free of charge, a $250,000 McLaren sports car, okay? V12, 
gorgeous, creme de la creme, zero to six million in four seconds, like like the car, like a supercar, quarter of a million dollar supercar. I'm gonna give it to you for a month just to play, okay? But there's a couple of things. First of all, if you damage anything, you have to pay for it. Fair enough, right? Right. Okay. So we're in agreement? Yes. Okay, but um, there's an agenda list for the first day that you have to follow. Okay. Okay? So I'm gonna give you the car the first day. You have to drive it till it runs out of gas. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> sounds pretty fun. <laughs> Road trip, right? Now, once it's empty, you have to fill it up with Gatorade, egg whites, mud puddle water, gasoline, diesel fuel, and whatever you can find in the 7-Eleven. You have to drain all the coolant, drain all the oil, flatten the tires, and you have to drive for one hour at 200 kilometers an hour. Are you still interested in the quarter of a million super, dollar supercar that you have to pay for damages? Yeah, no. I don't know. Hard pass. <laughs> yeah. That is. Hard pass. Yeah. There's no chance. You would never, even all the other things, it, just the fuel, you would never fill up your minivan with mud puddle water and diesel fuel. Never. It would just, it would ruin it. But people do it all the time. They go to fast food restaurants and eat garbage. It's not even food. They eat packaged with garbage. And they're like, oh, craft dinner and hot dogs is cheap. Yeah, but it's not even food. Like, but is it cheap though? In it's the long not, run, is it cheap? Exactly. It's not. It, that's a, it's a terrible investment. Fast food isn't, but sometimes packaged food is cheaper than... Can we argue that uh, a 12 pack of macaroni and a, and a 24 pack of hot dogs is cheaper than than chicken breast or cottage cheese and real vegetables and rice, you can argue that. Yep. Yeah, that's true. I just know people who would say yeah, that. Yeah, 100%. Oh, we have teenagers in the house. Yeah. We have teenagers yeah. in the house that if we have all the good stuff and they go to the fridge and they're like, there's nothing to eat. Yeah. Like, how do you get over that? Yeah. No, because like, they have to actually put forth effort. Like, no, they, they, you know. There's no food in the house. There's just ingredients to make food. Yeah, exactly I know, it. right? And I get that is a challenge. I have an 11 year old boy and, and he would live on pizza and spaghetti if I would let him. So then it becomes about education and understanding. Again, we're talking goals. This food will take you away from your goals. This food will bring you towards your goals. If your goal is to be healthy and fit and have a great, wonderful life, this food will help you. This food will harm you. And it's not like we can never eat the food that harms us. We can have it once in a while. It's like driving your car over a speed bump. You can do that once in a while. But if you drove on a road that was nothing but speed bumps and you're in a hurry, you're going to wreck your vehicle. Right. Right? The first book I ever wrote was called If Your Body Were a Car, You Wouldn't Treat It This Way. So I always make car references. Right? <laughs> we, we take care of our car because if we don't, it quits. That's right. We don't take care of our body because it's genius and it finds a way to continue. But our body finds a way to continue at a cost. You don't know what's going on inside. When you eat crappy, nutritionally poor food, your body sacrifices internally. Okay, I'm going to steal some copper from here. I'm going to take, from, I'm going to leach out of the bones. I'm going to pull from the ligaments. I'm going to steal from the muscles. I'm going to pull that out of this organ. And, and okay, we can keep going. You can do that. But at 20 or 30 years down the road, it catastrophically fails. You're like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> because you were not aware of the sacrifices that are happening internally when we eat junk. And so we have to just understand that we can't do that, mm -hmm. right? And when do we eat junk the most? When we're sad, we're depressed, we're miserable. You know, during 2020, we're forced to stay at home. We're not allowed to hang out with our friends. We weren't allowed to go to church. We weren't allowed to gather. Couldn't go to the gym, couldn't. And, and we're stuck at home and miserable. And so we eat junk food. So with that, what we've talked about with food, um, I've read studies where they talk about the stomach is directly affected with your brain. Mm -hmm. There are more bacteria 
cells in our body than human cells. We're more bacteria than human. Mm -hmm. And when we eat healthy food, raw food, raw veggies, um, you know, yogurts with acidophilus and bifidus and, and fermented foods, stuff like that, that fuels that good bacteria. And that helps us digest our food, helps us break it down, helps us absorb the nutrients, and that directly feeds the brain. The whole system works. When we eat dead food, deep fried food, junk food, refined food, canola oil, seed oils, trans fats, sugar, it, it doesn't help. In fact, sugar feeds candida albicans, which is a yeast. Like, so it feeds the wrong, good, the wrong stuff. So everything about it is upside down because your, your body exists as a complete unit that plays well together or is unsupported. And nutrition is massively, massively. Like I have a nutrition program, it's 21 days, and people are flabbergasted at how much better they feel. And all we did was change your food. We just went back to real food and we got rid of the dumb stuff, right? right? And it's profound how much it changes things. And the other opening question you asked was about exercise and, and mental health. They're very closely related. The human body is designed to move and we're designed to eat actual real food, right? right? Fast food, junk food didn't come around till the 50s. Mm -hmm. in, in evolutionary terms, it's brand new. Mm -hmm. It's brand Like hunter-gatherers, like you spent a lot of your day getting food. 100%. So, or in preparing it and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right down to chewing. Like our, our facial structure has changed from the industrial revolution because our food became soft. We're no longer gnawing on raw carrots and gnawing meat off the bone or chewing on tubers. We don't, we don't spend as much time chewing. We eat mush. Everything's cooked and mushy and soft. And so our molars and our jaw becomes less developed. And so then our body design changes. Our jaw comes in. We don't, like, there's no more room for wisdom teeth. So we pull them out because our jaws. And when that happened, our nasal cavities shrunk a little bit and we started breathing through our mouth instead of our nose. We're designed to be nose breathers. And because of our changes in food, we've become mouth breathers. Now, there's a couple of really great books on this. Um, one of them is called Breath and uh, Chad Nestor, I think. And he actually went under the catacombs of Paris. There are thousands of kilometers of catacombs underneath Paris full of dead bodies. Because in, the, in the, the plague eras and stuff, they just dumped people into things and they buried them and they just covered them in. And he went back and back and back essentially in time to look at skulls of people 200, 300, 400 years ago and their nasal capacity was larger. Their jaws were further forward. There was more developed. It's fascinating how that's changed us. And when we have gone away from, so one of the things he did in his book was he did an experiment where um, he plugged and taped his nose for, I believe it was a month and he could only mouth breathe. And it was insane. His, he gained weight, his, all of his cholesterol numbers went terrible. His blood work got terrible. His heart rate got terrible. His mental acuity diminished. He had a snot ton of medical problems. Came instantly on because he's no, not breathing through his nose anymore. Your nose is a filter and it has a calming effect and it changes your hormones and your energy. And it's, it's so profound. We are supposed to breathe through our nose most of the time. When we sleep, we're supposed to breathe through our nose. We, we, people don't. They mouth breathe. Do you want to know why you're snoring? You're mouth breathing. I'm okay, I'm not a doctor. I can't say everybody, but right, I happen to sleep beside somebody who snores. And it's mouth breathing is a problem. And after reading this book, I started conscientiously nose breathing. Like, shut my mouth and breathe through my nose more, more, more often. I even tried running just nose breathing. And it's so hard because I'm not used to it. And if I, of course, I run really fast, it's really hard. But it's profoundly powerful. And again, it's a simple change in nutrition. We don't chew so much and we nose breathe. We've changed those two things and they have had a massive echo 
on our whole population. I know we're on like a total rabbit trail here. But. I, I, I like the tangent because there's a part in your documentary, well, our documentary, uh, where, where you basically, you, you had to work on your breathing and like who would have thought breathing yeah. would, have, would have had such an impact on your, on your comeback recovery, yeah. right? Like, it was insane. When I flew to Germany and met Inga Jörg Clausen, he lives in Germany, but he's from Austria, and he does a, I'm going to call it an ancient technique, which is just breath work. It's just breathing. And I would spend an hour a day with him, learning to breathe through my nose properly. And you're like, what, what do you mean I don't know how to breathe? <laughs> I just breathe. <laughs> like... You can't be alive without it. Like, how do you, no, we have forgotten how to breathe. We don't nose breathe and we should shut your mouth. Like, and it's funny because there's a, there's a big thing on now. There's, and I, I don't love the name of it, but there's a company called Hostage Tape. And, and you can buy packets of tape and you tape your mouth shut when you go to sleep at night. And I just, at first, when I first, I thought, oh, what a terrible idea. And then I thought, actually, wait a second. And I started doing a bunch of research. It's profoundly intelligent. It's amazing. And your body adapts and your nasal passages get a little bit wider, a little bit bigger. And when you can nose breathe better, you will be healthier. You better oxygenate your brain. You filter out toxins and pollutants through the little hairs in your nose. There's a million different things that happen. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And it's so simple that people, it's underused. People don't understand. And, and the other thing you asked about was exercise. Like exercise is the best drug in the world. It's miracle grow for your brain. There are so many different books, um, oh my gosh, that talk about how exercise profoundly affects us. And for me, after the crash, I remember being in the hospital and it was like one o'clock in the morning. So when I went to the hospital in Canada, so we flew back from, from Kona, they had bolted my skull back together, a big metal staple sticking out of my skull. And, but they didn't know my arm was broken in three pieces. They didn't x-ray far enough. They x-rayed my wrist, but not my arm. So they didn't know it was broken. And they knew my shoulder was broken, but they thought, well, it's, you know, it's, it'll heal. By the time I got to Canada, I, cause I, was, my shoulder was in a big slope and I couldn't supinate and pronate my hand. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna go see the doctor. And I went for, for x-rays. And I remember being in the, in the hospital hallway when the tech came out she goes okay i've got your x-ray results and um first of all she's like i can't believe they let you out of the hospital in kona your shoulder is shattered like, it's in four pieces she's like and i don't know how they missed it but your arm is broken in half that's why it hurts she's like you need to go in for surgery so i'm sending you to the emergency room i was like oh okay so i went to the emergency room and i was there for a long time five or six hours um, before I could get in to see a doctor and they're like, holy crap. So anyway, they put me in and I was prepped for surgery for seven o'clock in the morning. But by the time they could squeeze me in, it was seven o'clock at night. And they worked on me till midnight or something, five hour surgery, rebuilt my shoulder, rebuilt my arm, checked on my brain, bunch of stuff. And I remember Dr. Gadelli said, um, she explained the thing and she said, do you have any questions for me? I'm like, yeah, when can I train again? <laughs> She's like, what? what? I just rebuilt you. And I know you remember that from the, from the documentary, but um, I said, when can I start training again? She said, well, you can't swim for a long time. You can't bike for a long time, but you can probably start running in about a month. And I was like, so 30 days and I can run? And she just laughed and I did. 30 days post-op, I Velcroed my arm to my chest and I went for a run. It was a crappy little run. It was more of a shuffle. It wasn't very fast. I didn't go very long, but I came home from that run and I felt a, like a million times better and I peed out black anesthesia. I could smell the anesthesia that I peed out. It was gross. And prior to that, I had lost my sense of taste. Everything, all my food, especially proteins and fat, not as much carbs, but tasted like I would imagine burnt urine would taste. That's the closest I could describe this. Everything tasted horrible. At first I thought, there was hospital food. And then I thought, well, my wife isn't a very good cook, which is not true, right? <laughs> so even like some of the stuff in, in Kona when we were still in Hawaii, I was like, oh, this tastes really funny. And we got back to Canada. I was so excited to be back in Canada. So we went to Timmy's and I got a chili and it tasted terrible. And I was like, why did I ever like this? This tastes awful. And I thought it was just the chili was awful. And then it just, and then after all, I was like, wait a second, this isn't the food. 
this is me. But after I went for a run and I peed, my taste came back immediately. Everything tasted normal again. And that was because of exercise. Peristalsis, the jostling, the moving, the, the, the rhythmic pulsing of your body in motion. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've studied and studied and studied how exercise changes blood flow patterns, it oxygenates the brain, it changes hormones and enzymes, and it literally regrows brain cells. Exercise, especially cardio, weight training is not the same. Cardio is so good for your brain. It's a miracle. Yeah. I want to jump on this because yeah. for me, it was crucial. Like, honestly, it saved me during my divorce because it was such a low time for me. Mm -hmm. um, and running was just my escape. Like, there's, there's something to that, I think, where I can just go out and do something and it's self-love. It's, it's being there with myself and knowing, like, look, I can do something, you know, because it was a low point where it was just like everything else was just crashing, but it's like this I can succeed at. Yeah. And so it was like, there's just so much power in that, like to the brain. Like I was just, I, I like, I can look back on it. Like the time I maybe didn't even like clue into it, but mm -hmm. it made such a difference to me in my like well being and, and being able to have like just moments to, to, to be with myself, to be feeling good, yeah, you know? And then I think back to the breathing part, I'm gonna couple that with it because when I went to therapy, my, my therapist really worked, like, worked on that. Like when you're going through stress, high times, it's that like flight or flight. Sometimes you just need to calm down and just focus on what you can. Mm -hmm. And that's breathing and breathing like brings you to the present. Yeah. And it just, and so I coupled that with my running, I would, I would go out and run and I would focus on my breathing. And it was just like, it was just key to, to really just taking it step by step, make it, I'm going to get through this. I can do this. And uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's one of those things like you're saying, it's just like, I mean, it wasn't it, like, <sighs> A huge thing but I think it, it really put me in the right mindset and it just kept me on the right path so mm -hmm. and I remember at the time you started running because you wanted to keep up with me because you were filming me at the Ultraman World Championship so you needed to be fit enough to lug camera gear and do all, and I was great and I love that <laughs> which is so cool um, and you're right like and it comes back to what we said and everything's crap and everything's crumbling down great what can I do about it and, and I can't fix that, but I can go for a run yeah. or I can eat good food or I can take care of myself. Or but I what's, can what's my also cool about that is it's, I didn't start running because I was going through bad times. Right. I was already running. Yes. But because I was, it yeah. was like, I know how to do this. Right. And I think sometimes that's, that's, that's what's key is like, don't wait until, you know, until you get the doctor telling you, oh, oh you need to work out. You need to eat better. Mm -hmm. Like do it now. Yeah, because that's what's going to get you through it. And I think the other part is for you. Why did your body actually cope and like make it through? Well, because you were you were you were an athlete. You were in good shape. You were eating right. Mm -hmm. So your body was able to heal, I think, better. Yeah. Numerous doctors told me the only reason I survived that crash was because I was so fit and healthy and my body could manage that level of trauma and not quit. Because it was bad. Like, at 70 kilometers an hour, I cartwheeled down a highway. You know, I mean, I had a chunk of styrofoam on my head, <sighs> right? Which my helmet wasn't done up properly and it spun. That's how I broke my skull open. But um, yeah, being fit and healthy means you can manage all of the things. And it, it, again, it goes back to a car analogy. If you have a really healthy four by four that's in good, well-maintained condition, it goes over a bunch of crappy bumps, no problem. If you have a rusted down, beat up, fallen apart, duct taped together jalopy with half flat tire and you go over a catastrophic bump, it falls apart. You're done. It's toast, right? Yeah. Your body's the same. If you're, you're super overweight and you're not taking care of yourself and your poop smells like toxic nuclear waste and you're uncomfortable and you can't sleep and you have no energy and and, and you have a health crisis, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. You're in trouble fast.
right? But if you're fit and healthy and a health crisis comes your way, you're all right. If, if you're fit and healthy and get COVID, I've had it twice. It was annoying. It was an annoying flu. But if you're really unhealthy and you get it, it's, it could be life ending, right? It's like everything. So the, the, the benefit of eating well and being healthy is so profound and so powerful and so healing. There's a great running shoe company ad, or there was, I don't know if it still is, but it showed this person running and behind them were words fading behind them. So it's like, like sort of schmooing off the back of them and it was stress, worry, anxiety, blah, blah. It was all the crap words of life just fading away as they ran. And it's so true. And you don't have to be a good runner. You don't have to run far. You don't have to run fast. You know, you could, it doesn't matter. Like be where you are and just move through. Like and you could ride a bike. You could, there's a million different things, but you got to move. <clears throat> it does miracles. And like I said, we can show like on fMRI, like magnetic resonance imaging, um, where we show the brain improving after exercise. It's, it's provable, you know? It seems so funny. What should you do? Eat real food, exercise, breathe through your nose. Like, that's it? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's that simple. It just takes work and effort. <laughs> yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy. No, but it's simple. No, no. Cool. and that's really hard in a society where instant gratification is at your fingertips. Yeah. Well, and that, you know, that's why I, what I love doing what I do too is because it's easy to say, don't eat junky fats and don't eat bad. Don't do. Okay, well, what does that look like? Well, how? How do I do that? Oh, okay, great. Well, here's a bunch of recipes. Oh, okay. Right? Some, like, we need help. I mean, I flew to Germany to have a guy teach me to breathe. <laughs> Who doesn't know how to breathe? Like, but apparently I didn't know how to breathe. So yeah, we always need help. Having a good coach makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, I think that, that goes, you need help, right? And so I, I, this is the other thing I wanted to dovetail off of and, and, and talk about is to me, what, what really hit home as I was filming the documentary we did is this idea that people just rallied around you like you crashed but there was just so much outreach and love mm. and the idea that you know what we we need to accept that yeah we need to be be able to and i i love the word ohana mm -hmm. you know hawaiian the ohana the family the people mm -hmm. and so yeah i'd like to talk about you know how important is that it's huge. And of course, I'm a big Lilo and Stitch fan. So, Ohana means family. And family means nobody that's left behind or forgotten. So, I have to do that. I don't have to, but I did. Um, so, yeah, Ohana, the word for family is so amazing. Like, during that time, if you look at what was required for me to live through that moment, Peter and Adam stopped to save my life. Adam's wife held her hand on my open exposed brain and <laughs> helped put pressure on it so I didn't bleed out. And then Lyle, who hates blood and body parts and ambulances, rode in the ambulance, keeping me awake and holding on to me all the way to the airport and then flew to another island and slept in a chair in my room to make sure I was okay and defended me against them, giving me too much morphine and, and engaged me and, and was answering questions and helping me. And you and Doug and everybody else carried on, picked up everything, cleaned up everything. You kept filming. All of the other athletes kept being inspirational. One of the athletes knew a friend who had a house in Oahu so that Hillary and Caden had a place to go and somebody to babysit Caden. People brought food to Hillary and when I got back, they brought food to us and they did, people came to help me pack up for the flight. Um, there were prayer groups started in Sylvan that I didn't even know about until a year later that actively gathered to pray for me. Like it's like, I had no idea how many people gathered to support and help. That was massive, huge. And I realized that I had a responsibility to it as well because I didn't, I, like I was so stuck in my own paradigm, but then 
there was a couple situations where Lyle was getting really mad like a month later because at the gym, people would ask about the crash and he would get all crotchety and grumpy and storm off. And I was like, what is going on? He's like, everybody keeps talking about the crash. It's in the past. Like, let it go. I'm like, it's not in the past for me. It's still real. I, I'm still living through this. And I won't get into the lengths of that, but I realized that Lyle was really hurting. It really traumatized him and he needed help. And so I worked with him to get him a counseling session with somebody I know is really good. And then I reached out to Peter and Adam and Adam was a kind of okay. Cause Adam was a cop in Australia. He's the other guy that helped me, but Peter was a mess. He couldn't get on a bicycle for three months. He, he couldn't ride his bike. He would get his kit on, walk outside, cry, go back in the house, put his bike on the trainer. He couldn't ride his bike after seeing me crash down the highway. So I realized that the Ohana was both directions and everybody. So I realized I needed to reach out and support everybody that was in, in, involved in the whole thing. I mean, you and I chatted and everybody needed to, to be together on the recovery. It wasn't just me that recovered. Everybody had to recover. And every time I posted a video of me out running or training or whatever, every time I got a little better, it's like the whole group got a little better and a little better. And, and getting back to the world championships became more about everybody healing than just me. Mm, that, we're all connected. We are. We are all connected. And that was the hard part about the, the 2020 is they, they disconnected us. Right. And that's the worst thing. Human beings are... We're social creatures. We need connection. I feel like with, you know, we've touched a lot on mental health and I feel like um, it's a multifaceted approach. Diet, it's exercise, it's your ohana, your support team. It's, you know, all the things that we should be doing, setting goals. These are the things that matter for our physical and our mental health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I like that we, we touched on all those things and that I appreciate your expertise, your, your experience, your um, comments on all the things that we talked about. Um, if there was one thing you would tell people you were training to get over the challenges that people face, what would be the best advice that you would give somebody who feels like they have limits or that they can't do it or that they don't have the abilities to they keep telling themselves like what would you tell hmm that's a big great question we have to have a faith and a trust that we are much more powerful and profound than we realize mm -hmm. and sometimes i do that by like i said listening to audiobooks of other great people and realizing they had struggles too right, right? we think that they just woke up and were magic and they're not like Wayne Gretzky wasn't the greatest hockey player of all time just because he was born to it. He trained and practiced and played and he loved it and nobody succeeds alone. That's right. You know, and those are all the big pieces of it. <laughs> there's a, there's a shirt. It's like I, 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 my aspiration has become the, person my dog thinks I am, right? right? So I think sometimes one of the great things about other people, <clears throat> if you have the right people, is try to look at yourself through their eyes. Because when I look at myself through my eyes, I still see failure and insufficient and not good enough and blah, 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 blah. blah. And that so easily leads to depression if you're left alone. Yeah. But when I ask, when, when somehow I hear about what other people think of me, I'm just like, wait, what? <laughs> you think I'm good? Oh, really? Wow. Like, okay. So sometimes we have to realize our impact on other people. And that's why it's important to build each other up yeah. and, and to support each other. And um, to reach out when you're struggling. To reach out when you're struggling. Because I think people, um, if they only knew you were struggling, they would be right there willing to help you. And that's the biggest problem. People that are struggling don't reach out. Yeah. That's how we lost Robin Williams. Mm -hmm. So many great people. Yeah. You know, it's like, if you, if you picture, if I was to say, describe somebody drowning. Oh, they're splashing and flailing. No, drowning is quiet. You just slip under the surface and you're just not there anymore and nobody notices you're gone. Mm -hmm. Right? I've seen somebody almost drown twice. 
And if you're not watching, like I was with actually Darren and his son went under the water at the pool. We were all over here laughing and giggling and he just very quietly went under the water. And I, I kind of, with the corner of my eye, saw it. Darren noticed and was in the pool pulling him up, gasping and spluttering water out. Drowning doesn't look like a mess. It's very quiet. And depression doesn't look like a mess. This is very quiet. And so it's easy to say, oh, if you're struggling, reach out. No, people don't reach out when they're struggling. No, we have don't. to notice they're struggling and then reach out. And yeah. I think that's a piece of it. About, that's why Ohana matters. Family matters. Being together matters. Getting in groups matters. Socializing matters. Asking people how they're doing for real. Yeah. <laughs> and recognize that everybody's going through something. Yeah. And so it's like... Just treat everybody like they need it. Yeah. You know, like you're, you're probably going to hit Be somebody, right? right? Yeah. 90% of the yeah. time is yeah. expecting that people are in crisis. Totally. And I think the best way out of depression, the best way out of crisis, one, exercise for sure, good food for sure, but also focus on gratitude. Yes. What's good? What's still working? What can you control? What can you control? What's, yeah, what, because we have to focus on the good. Mm -hmm. You get more of what you focus on. So if you focus on the good, you get more good. And even if it's the littlest, littlest, little bit of good, it's still good. And you have to focus on the good because that's where your energy goes. That's where your attention flows. And that's where your results come. If you focus on the bad, you will, in a, you'll be in a quagmire of yuck. There's an abundance of bad. There's yeah. no shortage of bad. We have to look for good. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that's a great place to end. We always have to look for good. Your documentary, mm -hmm. it's free on YouTube. It is, yeah. So we'll put a link there. People can check it out. Where else can they find you? Your personal trainer? Mm -hmm. So my website's pretty straightforward. Scott at scottyfit.com. So S-C-O-T-T-Y-F-I-T. So Scott at scottyfit.com. I do personal training. I do nutrition. Uh, I do coaching for endurance. And I also do keynote talks and trainings. So, um, And this know. is not just local. You'll, you'll train people. I go all, all over. over the place. Yeah. I've got clients in China, Ireland, the States. Yeah. Online's neat that way. <laughs> right? <laughs> There's no limits anymore. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. That's great. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being on with us, Scott. We've really uh, we, enjoyed uh, it. Yeah. Giving us lots to think about. Yeah, you're welcome. I, hopefully it's enjoyable for everybody watching. And um, yeah, it's life is a gift. Just keep focusing. Like we always say, you know, focus on progress, not perfection. And forward is a pace. Awesome. Thanks for joining us and we'll catch you on the next video.